snap. The kick is in the air, and the kick this time is no, sir, Ree. No, sir, Ree. Final score, Tennessee 20, Florida 17. Pandemonium reigns. You're listening to the RTI Podcast, powered by Walking Dog Insider. Welcome into the Rocky Top Insider Podcast. I am not Nathaniel Rutherford, but I am Ben McKee. Uh, as most of you know, Nathaniel is no longer with Rocky Top Insider. He has decided to pursue avenues outside of media. And again, as most of you know, he stepped down about two weeks ago. So uh, it was just a matter of time before we brought the podcast back. And no better time to do it than the day of fall practice getting underway for Tennessee football and on the heels of Tennessee basketball, landing one of the best players in the country for the class of 2021, landing five-star point guard Kennedy Chandler, who is viewed as the number one point guard in the class of 2021 uh, by multiple recruiting services. So I thought it'd be a great time to bring back the podcast that's been on a two-week hiatus as we have made the transition at Rocky Top Insider from Nathaniel to myself. Uh, Again, I am Ben McKee, the the new managing editor. And if you are a previous listener of the Rocky Top Insider podcast, you are well aware of who I am. I always appreciate the interactions and appreciate you guys tuning in. So uh, I hope you all look forward to uh, the the podcast that will come in the the near future. But on today's podcast, uh, as I briefly spoke about, we are talking Tennessee football, we are talking Tennessee basketball, and Tennessee basketball is where we will start before we get to Brad Matthews later in the podcast to preview the SEC schedule release that will take place later on Monday afternoon and into the evening. Uh, We've got Mike Wilson of the Knoxville News Sentinel on the podcast to talk Tennessee basketball and the fireworks that have gone off within the program over the last two weeks. Mike, how are you? Doing well, Ben. Thanks for having me on. And uh, to clarify, I also am well aware of who you are, just like Rocky Top Insider readers. <laughs> I, I am glad that you are well aware of who I am. I am, I am also well aware uh, of who you are, as uh, I can't tell the good people how many times per week I am running near my, uh, my lovely <laughs> home on the running trail and get to see a shirtless Mike Wilson out and about, out in the wild, <laughs> on the running trail. Not sure if that's a treat or not, but it's a thing. <laughs> yeah, that that's a different conversation. But uh, I appreciate you hopping on the uh, the program this this morning. Plenty to talk about in regards to Tennessee basketball, and we'll start exactly there with Kennedy Chandler, a five star point guard from previously Briarcrest there in Memphis, a Memphis native who is going to play his senior season uh, out in Kansas, a, a year of prep ball for for him. Just your reaction off the cuff. Uh, to Kennedy Chandler selecting Tennessee over Duke, North Carolina, Kentucky, and Memphis? I mean, the reaction to me was about time. Uh, I mean, that, that was my initial one because Kennedy Chandler, since his official visit, has been rumored or expected to be, uh, from my understanding, either coming to Tennessee or going to Duke. Um, but there's been so much chatter, especially in the last couple months, about Kennedy Chandler to Tennessee that it just seemed like a – a complete foregone conclusion that he was going to announce it at some point. So, uh, I mean, that was my first reaction. And secondly, obviously, is wow um, for the program. I mean, obviously, there's been some big-time recruits in the last two cycles as well with, you know, Josiah Jordan-James, Jaden Springer, Keon Johnson. But this is different. Uh, the offer list for Kennedy Chandler is, is different. Um, and that that's what makes this such a special commitment, I think. It, it kind of... Because, as you, you spoke about, we, we've kind of had a feeling that this is going to pop for a while. At least that has been the rumors on, on the rumor mill. It kind of takes the sting away of just how big of a prospect this is for Tennessee to land. Um, in, in your opinion, I mean, wh- and the people that you talk to, just how big of a talent is Kennedy Chandler and, and Tennessee getting in him? I mean, he, he's you know he's the number one point guard in the country. He, he's an elite talent in every single sense of it. Um, the only knock I think anyone can find on him is size. He's a little bit slight. 
but he's so crafty and clever and good around the basket that it almost doesn't even matter um, that that's a piece of, of his his game ability. Um, but yeah, I mean, this is, again, to, to me, if I was looking at from an offer list perspective and a who you beat for a kid, this is the most notable kid that, that Rick Barnes has landed and one of the most notable kids in Tennessee basketball history in terms of recruiting. And that's such a big deal. I mean, you go out in the recruiting trail and you beat out UNC, Duke, uh, Kentucky. He had a Kansas offer, too. You know, Fox, uh, I think it was Fox College Basketball yesterday tweeted out, a, uh, or on Sunday, tweeted out a, like a picture that was like, if you're a five-star recruit, which one of these coaches would you want to play for? And it's Bill Self at Kansas, John Calipari at Kentucky, or, yeah, at Kentucky, uh, Roy Williams at UNC, Mike Krzyzewski at Duke, and Tom Izzo at Michigan State. Well, Kenny Chandler picked Tennessee over four of those guys. So, I mean, that just kind of tells you, tells you the, the grand scheme of how big of a deal this is. An aspect of his commitment that I want to dive into is the, the fan reaction from the other schools that were in consideration. Uh, this, this is the typical fan thing to do when a kid doesn't pick their school, but it's always uh, such and such didn't want them anyways. You know, you, you saw that sentiment from from Memphis fans that oh, this isn't a surprise, this isn't a big deal. Penny Hardaway backed off of him a long time ago. You, you had some of that sentiment uh, from Kentucky fans a, as well. Uh, North Carolina fans, eh, a little bit. Uh, North Carolina never really was in, in the in the picture, in my opinion. I think it was. If it wasn't Tennessee, then it was probably Kentucky or Duke and, and maybe Memphis. But North Carolina was fifth, in, in my opinion. Opinion You may know or feel differently. Um, but now with Duke, I will credit Duke fans, at least the Duke fans that I saw on social media. Uh, they were just kind of, wow, that, that's a nice pickup for Tennessee. Good for him. They got, a, they got a good point guard in Kennedy Chandler. But the reaction from Memphis fans saying, oh, Penny backed off of him a long time ago. Uh, the same with Kentucky fans. Oh, Coach Cow backed off of him a long time ago. I don't know about you, Mike, but yes, those coaches backed off of Kennedy a long time ago, but it wasn't because they they um, weren't fond of Kennedy Chandler's game. It's because Kennedy Chandler has been trending to Tennessee for quite some time now. I agree with that, and, and that is the typical reaction when a kid commits to any school. Uh, I mean, you know, Tennessee football goes snacks, a guy like Dylan Brooks. Who's supposed to go to Auburn? You know, the reaction is, oh, yeah, we didn't want him anyway. I mean, that, that's just the classic fan base reaction to any commitment going somewhere other than their school. Um, but certainly, that's that's a, the thing with Kennedy Chandler, and and the interesting one is the Memphis thing. I mean, yes, he's a Memphis kid, but it never seemed like Memphis gained a ton of traction in his recruitment. Uh, like I kind of mentioned earlier, it always seemed like Tennessee, Duke. You know, I don't know if UNC was fully in the picture, but I know they recently were reported to have a Zoom visit or some form of visit with him. Um, they were kind of in the picture. Kentucky's always in the picture in some way. But it did always seem, again, ever since the official last October, that, that Tennessee was in the driver's seat for this thing. And, and they never really seemed to lose that. Um, if I'm not mistaken, I'm trying to think back on his officials. I feel like he took a – Syracuse and Michigan, maybe yep. as well. Like those and Ole never, Miss, and that's I mean the proximity to Memphis, obviously being the reason, but that's kind of an odd one. Um, yes, yeah, so, I mean of his five finals, the only school he even took an official to was Tennessee, and that was his first official visit. So you know, it, it just always seemed like it was going to Tennessee. So I can see an element there where coaches probably did back off because I mean, you're, when you're recruiting in basketball, you don't have a lot of targets every year, and you're not going to waste your time pouring and pouring and pouring you know, kid that you don't think you're going to get. Yes, and speaking of that official visit that Kennedy Chandler took, he was not the only one on that official mm -hmm. visit. And this commitment has so many different layers and, and, and limbs to, to talk about. Uh, and, and Paulo Bonchero is one of those nuanced layers um, that, that applies to the Kennedy Chandler to Tennessee commitment. And, and as I was about to say, Paulo Bonchero and Kennedy Chandler were were on the same official visit back in October, I believe it was, and that was no coincidence. Uh, that was uh, very smart sh strategic planning by Kim English and Rick Barnes and the Tennessee coaching staff, uh, but also from 
Apollo's and Kennedy's standpoint, those two legitimately like each other. They are legitimate friends. Um, they played together at the teammate, Team USA uh, camp back in, uh, was that, last summer, I, I believe it was. They were roommates, and uh, the thought walking away from, from that event was the two played really well together, and they have openly talked about playing college basketball together since. Uh, in your opinion, how does – Kennedy Chandler's commitment to Tennessee affect Paulo Banchero to Tennessee? I mean, it doesn't hurt. I mean, that, that, that's certainly the baseline of it all. Um, I, I've never been a huge believer in, in package deal concept commitments for college basketball. I mean, Tyus Jones, Jewel Okafor, that was one that went to Duke. Uh, Mike Conley, Greg Oden to Ohio State back uh, in like 2004, 2005 range. Um, but the thing is, we can name how many package deals there were because they just don't happen that often. Um, but there's no way that this doesn't help Tennessee with Paolo Banchero. Um, he does like Kennedy. They p- seem to play well together, as you mentioned. And, and let's call it what it is. Everyone wants to play with an elite point guard because an elite point guard makes everyone else around them better. And if you're a guy like Paolo Banchero, that is exactly the kind of guy you want to be around. Plus, the player comps you see for Paolo Banchero, at least the ones I've seen her, P.J. Tucker, Tobias Harris kind of skill set. It's like, okay, well, one of them went to Tennessee. The other one was coached by Rick Barr. <laughs> so, like, there's a, fu- there's a funny little thing to that that, you know, that doesn't mean a lot, but it's kind of funny when you see that. Um, but yeah, that's got to help Tennessee. And the official visit thing's a big deal. But, you know, as I mentioned at the end there, talking about Kennedy on the last question, coaches don't waste their time pouring into someone they don't think they got a shot with. Kim English went to Washington quite a few times last year. You're not flying from Knoxville, Tennessee to Seattle in the middle of a basketball season if you don't think you have a serious shot with a player. And I think Tennessee really feels like they've got a good shot with Paolo Banchero. They've got to beat out Washington and Gonzaga, some in-state options. Arizona snuck in there late this year. Kentucky's always rumored to be a favorite. He's the number three player in the country. So, I mean, he's got no shortage of suitors. But obviously Tennessee feels like they've got a shot with the kid. Yeah, and and since Kennedy Chandler committed to Tennessee, my my hopes from a Tennessee perspective in terms of Tennessee's chances of landing Paulo Banchero, they have they have gone up significantly. Uh, to be honest with you, I, I don't know what percent I would put on, you know, if I was Tennessee, my confidence in in landing him. But I was of the belief pre Kennedy Chandler that it was going to be very hard for Tennessee to land Paulo Banchero because you have schools like Kentucky and Arizona and Duke and all these other schools. I think North Carolina's in there. But on top of those schools going after him, he has ties to Washington. His, his, both of his parents went there. Obviously, he lives in the state of Washington. And then Gonzaga is right down the the road as well. And Gonzaga under Mark Few is just a, a national power. So I thought it was going to be hard to pull – uh, such an elite talent that is a one and done all the way across America for just one college basketball season. I, I thought that was going to be very hard, no matter how well Kim English positioned Tennessee. But I think Kennedy Chandler is a legitimate domino. It's just like in football. Everybody wants to play with the elite quarterback. And as you mentioned, Mike, everybody wants to play with the elite point guard. And, and I truly believe that Kennedy Chandler could be what pushes – Paulo Banchero over the edge for for Tennessee. I, I think uh, Tennessee was probably second, third, fourth for for Paulo uh, pre Kennedy Chandler, and I, I can see Kennedy Chandler being what pushes him over the edge. And just over the weekend, uh, we saw two four seven Sports, uh, their their top college basketball analyst Jerry Meyer, put in a crystal mm-hmm. ball for Tennessee. And I'm not huge on the crystal ball because I. I you can always tell where a kid's going based off the crystal ball. <laughs> and and I kind of hate that because it ruins the kid's moment. But it's also a nice glimpse in into what's going to happen for the fans. So I thought that was very telling as well. Likewise, yeah. And I noticed that crystal ball as well. And, yeah, it's something – you notice it. I mean, you look back at Kennedy, like for Kennedy Chandler. There was a point in, I think, mid-July um, where, like, there was just a flurry of predictions to Tennessee. And that was kind of a week where I started hearing – uh, might be coming soon. And then, you know, the other day there was a couple more. It's like, all right, it's a done deal and everyone knows it now. Um, but, yeah, it, it, it's always an interesting indicator. And it's interesting to me when, you know, Kenny Chandler commits that later that day someone says, all right, 
Paolo Banchero is going to Tennessee. Right. Uh, I mean, that, that's noteworthy. And it wasn't a, a random 247 rider. And I say random, not in, in, in a term of disrespect, but there's a bunch of 247 riders. Uh, it's kind of hard to keep track of all of them. And every now and then you'll see a, a crystal ball and it'll be from a 247 rider that you just simply hadn't heard of yet. It, it wasn't somebody of that nature. It was Jerry Meyer, their, their top mm-hmm. <laughs> basketball guy, especially after Evan Daniels uh, is, is now becoming a sports agent, uh, as a matter of fact. So I thought Thank that was Evan Daniels. Yep. I thought that was very noteworthy. Joined that by Mike Wilson here on the Rocky Top Insider Podcast. I am Ben McKee. We are talking about all the layers that goes into Kennedy Chandler committing to Tennessee. The other layer is Kennedy Chandler being a vol, whether Paulo Bonchero joins him or not. What do you think the percentage chance is that Kennedy Chandler suits up next to Jaden Springer and Keon Johnson? Oh, man. Now, that's tough. Tennessee's backcourt is so interesting, even this year. Um, I mean, I, I don't know if you've heard this stuff, but Victor Bailey generated a lot of buzz last year off the scout team. Yep. And from all I understand, he might be the starting point guard this year. I mean, at least, at least he's in that competition. I mean, we've also got Santiago Vescovi in that competition. Jaden Springer's in that competition. Josiah Jordan James is kind of in that competition. I mean, you've got options at point guard like crazy right now as Tennessee. And what I'm going to be really interested in, Jaden Springer and Keon Johnson both certainly have that potential to be one and done. But what's the minutes going to look like this year? Because minutes kind of play a role to some extent in being one and done. I mean, they aren't the most important thing. If you play 20 minutes a game and you're awesome, you can go pro. But if you play 20 minutes a game and it's like you didn't get to showcase your skills, is it the same? Um, All this to say, I don't even know how to put a percentage on that. Um, I feel like Tennessee, like if I was a betting man, I'd probably say Tennessee loses two of the three of Josiah Jordan James, Keon Johnson, Jaden Springer after the year. Um, And this might be a surprise. I think Keon Johnson's probably the number one guy I would take to be gone next year. Um, His development and growth, I mean, he he skyrocketed last summer uh, when Tennessee landed him as a five-star recruit, but a guy who still seems to be on the upswing, and I think his upswing is going to continue. Um, so my more interesting question is, is Kenny Chandler going to be in a backcourt next year with Victor Bailey and Santiago Vescovi? Because that's an interesting backcourt, too. Mm-hmm. Um, but I don't think all of those guys are back next year. I don't think there's any way that happens. Um, t- Tennessee... You know, when Kennedy committed the other day, he was asked, who are you trying to bring with you? And he named three guys, Paolo Banchero, Jabari Smith, and Jemai Mashak from California. I butchered the name just like Kennedy did. Um, <laughs> that's four guys. Tennessee's graduating three. So they're planning on obviously losing at least one to the draft. Um, you can just do the simple math right there and see it. Yeah. There's so much to unpackage uh, with with Tennessee's guard situation, both for this season – <laughs> and going into to next year, so many different layers. And, and I've settled on the opinion of if Kennedy Chandler, Jaden Springer, and Keon Johnson do play together next or 2021, 2022, next, next season, I think something went wrong for Tennessee in the sense of mm. Jaden Springer and Keon Johnson should be a, a one and done just based off of expectations entering Tennessee, based off of their perceived talent from NBA people, both are projected as lottery picks as of today, uh, you would think that they they will only develop even more so into a lottery pick with this coaching staff uh, as they go through their freshman year. So I would be very surprised if Jaden Springer and and Keon Johnson are, are back for year two, just because that's the type of talent that they that they possess and and like like I said I I think something went wrong if Jaden Springer and and Keon Johnson are are back for for year two I personally think Josiah is a a three and done guy Uh, I I am still I still have plenty of stock in Josiah Jordan James I I think um, a a fully healthy Josiah Jordan James is a very good basketball player on both ends of the floor and, and I think he was really hampered by those injuries last year. So I, I think we'll we'll see a, a backcourt next year of Victor Bailey Jr., Kennedy Chandler, uh, Santiago, and Josiah. And I, I think that would be great because you mentioned Victor Bailey being the starting point guard this year. 
he can also play off the ball, and, and that may be mm-hmm. what he's better suited for. It's just right now Tennessee doesn't have a, a true point guard like a Jordan Bone or like a Kennedy Chandler. Uh, even Jaden Springer is considered a combo guard. Keon Johnson is better off the ball. Uh, so maybe Victor Bailey is being forced into that role. Maybe not. Maybe he is a true a true point guard. We haven't been able to see him a ton. I was always under the assumption that he was more of a, a two, two-way guard. Um, so I, I think s- he can do it, man. I think he's got that quickness and ability to play point. I think you're right, though, that he's not necessarily shoehorned in, but kind of being taught into it a little bit. Right. So he's got ability with the ball that's pretty wild. Um, so I, I'm curious on that one as well. Yeah, but you, you pair him next year with, with Kennedy Chandler. Kennedy Chandler can run point, and then – Santiago's better off the ball, in my opinion. Josiah's better off yeah. the ball, in my opinion. If Victor Bailey's kind of that same mold, then you have Kennedy Chandler running point, and those three are, are playing at their best off the ball. Uh, just unlimited potential there. Uh, before we get you out here, I do want to talk about Eve Pons and, and his decision because we have not been able to talk about that on the Rocky Top Insider podcast because, again, this is the first one since our transition uh, over at RTI. Um, but before I ask you about Pons, I want to ask you about – your opinion on expectations changing for Rick Barnes with, with these players uh, that, that he is bringing in. He has had a great amount of success at Tennessee, more success than most anticipated, but he, he's getting bona fide one-and-done players, t- one-and-done type players, five-star talents that, yeah, Grant Williams went on to be two-time SEC Player of the Year, and Adam Schofield was a draft pick, and, and so, so was Jordan Bone and Lamonte and Jordan Bowden and Kyle Alexander were all terrific college basketball players, but they far exceeded expectations <laughs> based off of their recruiting rankings. Uh, so just naturally, expectations are changing. What, In your opinion, how have expectations changed for Rick Barnes with these past two recruiting cycles? Well, they absolutely have changed, but you want them to change. Right. I mean, what Tennessee is doing right now at this level of recruiting, where you are recruiting the one-and-done types. I mean, like you said, It'd be surprising if those guys are back for a second year with Keon Johnson, Jaden Springer. When you're recruiting players of that caliber, the expectations go up. So you want to be recruiting players of that caliber and you want big expectations. And, and this is a team for Tennessee this year, you know, assuming the season season plays out as a semi normal year or anything remotely resembling that, Tennessee's got a great shot this year to do some special things. And Eve Pond's coming back a big part of that. John Fulkerson's development's a big part of that. Um you want the raised expectations. I mean, if, if you're a coach going into the year, you want to be considered a top 10 team going into every season. And Tennessee right now is, you know, a fringe top 10 team going into this season. You know, if they land another big recruit for the 2021 cycle, especially a big man, cause they, they need a, a, a probably big time big man for that class, you know, you're putting yourself in that conversation again with what you're returning and bringing in. Um, and that's what you want. I mean, a, any coach wants that. You got an opportunity to do something special, and and yeah, I mean Tennessee and Rick Barnes are capitalizing on what they did with guys like Grant Williams, Admiral Schofield, Jordan Bone, Kyle Alexander, and now they're cashing in on the recruiting trail, and they got a chance to do something really big. We'll have to have you back on uh, closer to the season to discuss fair expectations uh, for this upcoming season, uh, because. Like I said, we're going to end on Eve Pons, but I, I have another question I want to ask you before we get to Eve, and, and that's how you would compare where Tennessee is now to Michigan State. And the reason I ask that is, for people who do not know, <laughs> is Mike graduated from Michigan State, uh, grew up in Michigan, if I'm not mistaken, um, mm-hmm. and obviously Michigan State is considered a blue blood in, in college basketball and just one of the premier basketball programs year in and year out under Tom Izzo. Uh, shout out to Tom Izzo and, and Michigan State for uh, giving me Jaron Jackson Jr. I greatly <laughs> appreciate it. And how you did not play him more baffles me. Maybe you have an answer for that. But how would you compare where Tennessee is to Michigan State? Not necessarily looking at long-term success, but in the immediate future. Do you, do you think Tennessee's on a Michigan State, a Duke, or North Carolina's level? I don't. Um and and look at what Tom Izzo has done in recruiting in the last month is why I say that. Um, and this is not a knock on what Rick Barnes is doing on the recruiting trail, but Rick Barnes recruited a young man by the name of Kevin Durant about a decade ago, a little more than a decade ago. Michigan State just landed Imoni Bates, who's 
you know, they talk about him being, you know, another version of Kevin Durant um, for the 2022 class. I think they just landed a five star for the 2021 class mm-hmm. and a pair of others, like highly up there, top 100 kids. They, they might be recruiting better than anyone other than Duke right now. Um, yeah, Max Christie, number 14 overall player, popped to Michigan State recently. Uh, then they got a point guard the other day, a four star point guard, too. They're recruiting at a, at a crazy level. That I think I texted one of my buddies the other day. Uh, Izzo's doing everything he can to get that second national title before he has to retire. Um, you know, he won it in 2000, which I think he started at Michigan State in 95, 96 range. Um, it's been a long time since he's won it big, and he's recruiting at a level to, to win at that right now. Um, but I think the important caveat with all that is Tom Izzo has been at Michigan State for 25 some years, built something there. Um, you know, Rick Barnes is still working on building that there. Tennessee doesn't have that that exact brand of of basketball history and long tenured coach. And what he's done here is different in that respect. He has built something very very fast um, to where they're recruiting at a national level um, and doing that after being a long tenured guy at Texas. To me, is impressive in a totally different way. Um, what Tom Izzo is doing at Michigan State. Yeah, definitely a, a fair perspective, which I wanted to to get your pers- perspective on that because, uh, as I mentioned, you, you went to Michigan State. I've known that program, I imagine, your entire life or been following it for the majority of your life. Um will be fun to to see if Tennessee can can maybe get close to that point. It'll, it'll take a long run of sus- sustained success, even after Rick Barnes retires – uh, just because Rick Barnes is is older in age, obviously, and to have the type of run to to get to a Michigan State type level, uh, it's going to have to be past Rick Barnes, unfortunately. But as I keep mentioning, the last thing I want to talk about before I get you out of here, Mike, and I greatly appreciate your time is Eve Ponds. He announced, I guess it was two weeks ago, forced to 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 announce two weeks ago today, actually, uh, on this Monday, that he is returning to Tennessee for his senior year. And I say forced, not because Tennessee forced him to return or whatever, but the the NCAA did, I guess they worked with the, the players as much as possible. The NBA was giving players, I think, until actually to literally today, August 17th, of when they need to make a decision by to be in the NBA draft. But the NCAA set their own deadline of August 3rd. And on August 3rd, uh, Eve Pons announced that he would return for his senior season. What was your reaction to Eve Pons deciding to return? Yeah, I think you're right in the force element. I don't know if Eve Pons would have made the decision yet if uh, if the NCA hadn't set the earlier deadline. Um, I was surprised, and I think I'm in the minority there. Um, I thought Eve Pons would go to the NBA, and that's not from anyone telling me he's going to the NBA or anything that was out there. I just kind of had a gut feeling that he was an NBA guy. Um, you know, I talked to some people after his freshman year who kind of said, hey, yeah, you know, teams love his, his athleticism and everything. I was like, you mean the guy that played like three minutes a game? What are you talking about? Um, but he's just developed into such a player. And to me, Eve Pons is a guy that four or five NBA teams probably are obsessed with right now as a late first round, early second round pick. And to me, that's the peak of his stock. So I thought he might go. Um, so I was surprised. From a Tennessee perspective, that's great news for that program. Um, the, the effect that he has being on this team compared to not being on it is huge. Um, EJ Anasicki was a great addition as a grad transfer from Sacred Heart. He's not Eve Pond. He can rebound, he can score a little bit, but he's not that defensive freak of nature guy. Um, I thought that was a great addition. I thought if Eve left, it was a nice security blanket as a veteran guy at the four. But Eve Pons defensively, his athleticism, his shot blocking, and the offensive game that he developed last year to, to shoot. I mean, knock down threes. He's got the old turnaround game in him now. He's become such a different player that he is that guy. That, you know, we talked about Tennessee being a fringe top 10 team. He's the guy that is the difference between you being a 15 to 20 team going into the season and being an 8 to 12 team in the rankings going into the season. Uh, I mean, you can't really understate his importance on coming back to this team it's also huge because they now could possibly have a starting lineup with five lefties in it which i want (laughs) 
with Santiago, Josiah, Devontae Gaines, Fulkerson. No, Victor and Bailey. And, uh, that's right, Victor Bailey. I forgot Victor about that. Victor Bailey's left-handed, too. So I think... Victor Bailey, Santiago Viscovi, Josiah Jordan-James, Eve Pons, John Fulkerson. I don't think that's actually going to be the starting lineup, but the fact that they could start five lefties is awesome. Yeah. <laughs> and then the first guy off the bench could be another lefty as well. That That is – that is I'm surprised Kennedy Chandler was not a lefty. I know. It really breaks the mold of what Tennessee's been recruiting. It definitely does. But you and I have the same opinion on, on Pons returning. I, I personally think that Tennessee is, without a doubt, the favorite to win the SEC. I think they're the best team entering the season on paper with Eve Pons. They would have been good without him and, and a, a favorite, one of the top teams with a chance to win the SEC. But to me... Tennessee is without a doubt the the favorite uh, with Ponds. You, yes, you have Kentucky, and they have a bunch of talent, as always, but inexperienced talent. Uh, LSU is really the, the, the biggest competition, and, and Florida entering the season because they have arguably the same, same amount of talent, or they're in the same ballpark, and they have the same amount of experience. Uh, but I think when you look at leadership uh, from guys like Ponds and Fulkerson and what Victor Bailey will be, uh, as well as even Keon Johnson as a freshman, based off of things that we are hearing from uh, summer workouts. When you look at a leadership standpoint, an experience standpoint, a talent standpoint, and a coaching standpoint, I don't think there's another team in the SEC that checks off all of those boxes. There are other good basketball teams, but I don't think there's one that checks off all of those boxes. But we can get into that uh, at another time. Eve Pond's returning to Tennessee is is definitely a, a huge Huge, huge development for Tennessee basketball. Been a good two weeks for Tennessee basketball. You get Eve Pons back for his senior year. You, you land Kennedy Chandler. And it looks like you are trending for Paolo Bonchero, the number three overall player in the country. Mike, I appreciate your time this morning. How can people follow you and your work? Yeah, you can find me on uh, Twitter at by Mike Wilson, B-Y Mike Wilson, because when your name is Mike Wilson, creating a Twitter handle is not – easy at all Um, (laughs) that is where you can you can yell at me for my for my michigan state comments which i will back up with the recruiting data and only the recruiting data um you can also email me at michael.wilson at knocknews.com and find the work obviously at at goballdexter.com awesome i encourage everybody to follow the proud kiwi on twitter if you check mike's uh twitter bio you will understand that reference mike does a great job of covering tennessee basketball tennessee baseball and then chipping in with blake topmeyer to cover tennessee football there at the knoxville news sentinel mike uh, appreciate your time we'll do this again uh definitely closer to basketball season and i hope you enjoy a a busy monday as the sec releases its uh, 2020 football schedule and jeremy pruitt slated to talk after uh, tennessee's first football practice since march 12th Really appreciate Mike Wilson of the Knoxville News Sentinel for jumping on the podcast with us to discuss the latest developments with Tennessee basketball, which are pretty significant. Tennessee lands Kennedy Chandler, five-star point guard out of Memphis on Friday afternoon. Uh, They are now trending for Paolo Bonchero, the number three overall player in the country, according to 247 Sports. Eve Ponds returning to Tennessee uh, two weeks ago today, as a matter of fact. So plenty of positive news going on with the Tennessee basketball program. And as I mentioned, we have not been able to hammer out a a podcast just yet over the last two weeks in the midst of the transition from Nathaniel Rutherford to myself. But we're we're back in the flow of things. We're we're ready to rock, and and I look forward to, to churning out uh, a couple of podcasts per week, especially now that football season's here. And that is what we are going to talk about now. Uh, again, big thanks to Mike Wilson for joining the podcast to talk Tennessee basketball. Please, please go follow him. He does great work covering Tennessee basketball, also covers Tennessee football, along with Blake Topmeyer there at the Knoxville News Sentinel. We've got a little bit of an audible. It's just me for today's football portion of the podcast. We had a a, a conflict uh, uh, pop up for, for Brad, Math- Brad Matthews in, in terms of scheduling. Uh, so Brad is unable 
to to join us this morning. We will have Brad on the podcast tomorrow morning. You can look for another Rocky Top Insider podcast on Tuesday afternoon discussing the 2020 Tennessee football schedule that is set to be released tonight. So, again, I'm calling an audible. You're stuck with me. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, I kid, I kid. Uh, but I want to chop it up about uh, Tennessee's football schedule that is going to drop on Monday afternoon and also discuss Texas A&M and Auburn, the two non-conference or the non-division opponents that Tennessee added to its 2020 SEC schedule. Just like the Eve Ponds news, we have not had a podcast on Rocky Top Insider since that news dropped, so did want to discuss that. But again, Tennessee's official 2020 schedule will come out Monday afternoon. Uh, this podcast is is set to release just after uh, lunch on Monday. So hopefully you were able to tune in and listen. And you'll tune back in on Tuesday to get a reaction. So you get a preview of what I think uh, is best for Tennessee in regards to the 2020 schedule on Monday. And then on Tuesday, you'll get a reaction pod from myself and Brad Matthews due to a scheduling conflict that prevented him for, from hopping on the podcast this afternoon. But in, in regards to Tennessee's 2020 schedule, the week one opponent will be released at 3 p.m. Eastern on the Paul Feinbaum show. Four hours later, the complete 2020 10-game conference-only schedule for Tennessee will be released at 7 p.m. Eastern on the SEC Network. I believe it is SEC Now is the program that will be putting that out uh, with Dari Noka leading the way. And the big topic, topic of conversation right off the bat, since we know who Tennessee is playing, we just don't know when they are playing each particular opponent. The big question really going into this whole ordeal is who would be best for Tennessee to play first? There are quite a bit of theories out there. Um, you know, a lot of people want to play Florida first because Florida has a, a tendency to start the season slow over the first week, second week, third week of the season. And then as Tennessee fans know, they miraculously turn it around by the time the Tennessee Florida game rolls around. So uh, quite a bit of understanding as to why people would want to play Florida right off the bat. Uh, I also like the thought of Florida having to come to Knoxville in, in the heart of winter or the beginning of winter there in, in the back end of November and beginning of December. Those Florida boys, <laughs> they won't know how to react to the to the cold and I don't believe Florida has ever played in Knoxville against Tennessee at the end of the season. And I think that that weather, it wouldn't be the difference in Tennessee winning or losing, but it would definitely play a factor. Florida's used to playing Florida State in the state of Florida the last week of the regular season. They're used to playing a cupcake game in November. They're used to playing Georgia in the world's greatest outdoor cocktail party uh, that first weekend of November, I believe. They're not used to playing in cold weather in November. So I think that would also work in, in Tennessee's favor. And that's where I'm at in terms of where it would be best for Tennessee to play Florida. I do think it would be at the end of the season. Florida's an experienced football team. They know what they're going to be doing on offense. They lose some key pieces on the defensive side of the ball. But I, I think Florida, similar to Tennessee because of how many – returning players they have I think they're suited well to to get off to a good start whereas there are other teams on the schedule that they're going to need some time to gel so uh, I agree in theory with with playing Florida early in the season just because they always get off to a slow start but I, I'm 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 weird my mind doesn't work that way I I live in the in the present not the not the past and yes that is a trend for Florida I, I completely recognize that but this year's Florida team the past isn't going to affect this year's Florida team so uh, with Kyle Trask leading the way I think it would be best for Tennessee to catch Florida in Knoxville at the end of the season 
when it's a little colder. Maybe Kyle Trask isn't playing. Maybe Kyle Pitts isn't playing. Maybe they're a banged-up football team. I think it would be best for Tennessee to play Florida at the end of the season. So who do I think it's best for Tennessee to play at the beginning of the season? Week one, week two? I'm in the camp of playing Georgia week one or week two. Georgia is replacing a ton on offense, and their defense is going to be legit. Their, their second team and, and third team guys could start just about anywhere in the country. And they may not have a game this season where they allow more than 30 points. I mean, their defense is going to be lights out. The defense was not the problem last year for Kirby Smart. It, it was the offensive flow, and that's why he has a new offensive coordinator in Todd Munkin. And on top of having a new offensive coordinator, Georgia on offense must replace – the starting quarterback from last year, Jake Fromm, it's two top tailbacks in DeAndre Swift and Brian Herrien, four starting offensive linemen in Cade Mays, Andrew Thomas, Isaiah Wilson, and Solomon Kinley, and their second and fifth leading receivers, uh, Lawrence Cager, was hurt much of the year, and, and Tyler Simmons. So those are the two receivers that they must replace, and they have to replace their two top tight ends, Charlie Werner and Eli Wolf, a, a name Tennessee fans are very familiar with. So that's a lot to replace on the offensive side of the ball. Were they new offensive coordinator in an untraditional offseason in which they did not have spring practice, they did not have the typical summer to gel, and they're bringing in two new quarterbacks. One's a, a grad transfer in Jamie Newman who missed time over the summer due to a midfoot sprain, and he's just now getting back from that. And then JT Daniels has not even been cleared to practice yet after tearing his ACL at USC last year. So I think it would be really beneficial for Jeremy Pruitt, a defensive-minded head football coach, to catch an offense early in the season that you would, you would think is going to have some early season struggles. So I think it would be best to play Georgia week one or week two. And the reason I say week one or week two is because – in fairness, Jeremy Pruitt has not shown that he can get off to a, a hot start as a head coach in, in his two seasons at Tennessee. The, the West Virginia debacle year one, the Georgia State, BYU, Florida debacle last year in year two. And again, like I said a moment ago with Florida, the, the past has, has no indication of what's going to happen in the present. So just because Jeremy Pruitt has gotten off to a slow start in his first two seasons doesn't mean that he's going to get off to a slow start in year three. In fact, he has more weapons to, to prevent that from happening. He has a better culture. He has better leaders. He has more talent. His coaching staff is better. He's a different head coach. He's a better head coach than he was the first two seasons. So I don't think Tennessee is going to get off to a slow start but in case they do, it may be best to get the best of both worlds with playing Georgia at the beginning of the season, catch them week two, while also tipping your toes in the water week one with an easier opponent that you should beat to open up the season. And then you can hit the practice field in between week one and week two and fix those mistakes. And, and, and you know what your strengths and weaknesses are and what you need to improve on, what you need to, to really continue to emphasize. So that's why I'll, I'll take Georgia week one or week two, but I think there's, there's pros, more pros than there are cons uh, to playing Georgia week one or week two and then potentially even playing Georgia week two and allowing yourself to, 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 to dip your toes in the water week one with a game against – Arkansas, or Vanderbilt, or Missouri, even Auburn or Texas A&M. I'll talk about them in just a moment. Uh, I think ideally South Carolina would be a good test week one. Good test week one. Tennessee is better than South Carolina. South Carolina has issues up front along the offensive line. They've struggled to run the football during the course of Will Muschamp's tenure at South Carolina. Their, their star quarterback – is coming off of an injury-riddled freshman season. 
coming off of an off-season knee procedure. South Carolina would be a nice test for Tennessee week one that would also result in a win. So you get the best of both worlds. You're not playing a, a super easy opponent. You're not playing a cupcake. You'll you'll take some lumps, but you also come out on top. So I think it would be ideal for Tennessee to play South Carolina week one, come back, and play Georgia week two. Now, the downside to that would be playing back-to-back road games, but is, the, is it that big of a deal in a year in which there's not going to be any fans in the stands, especially at the beginning of the season? So just, just something to consider. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, Missouri, Vandy, Arkansas, Auburn, maybe even Texas A&M's are, are other solid to good week one opponents before you just dive into Florida, Alabama, Georgia. Now, I believe Tennessee and Alabama will still be played on the third Saturday in October. Over the weekend, there were reports that the SEC was trying to um, keep intact those those rivalry games in the SEC that are played on a specific date. The Tennessee-Alabama game on the third Saturday in October is one of those. The Iron Bowl, the Egg Bowl, the last week of the season are two other games. So I, I don't expect Tennessee-Alabama to be moved, but how does that affect the rest of the schedule? So um, in terms of what I think would, what would be best for Tennessee's 2020 schedule, catch Florida at the end of the season, get Georgia early, whether that be week one or week two. And if I had it my way, I would go to Georgia week two, and then South Carolina would be nice week one. But to throw a, a home game in before you have to go to Georgia, although, again, I don't think it will matter too much just because there won't be fans in the stands. Uh, play, I don't know, it kind of stinks because Tennessee's – easy SEC games this season are on the road with Vanderbilt, Arkansas. Maybe play Missouri week one. Missouri at home week one, at Georgia week two. I think that would be a a nice setup for Tennessee to start the season. In terms of Texas A&M and Auburn, well, one thought before that. Vanderbilt, Arkansas, and even Missouri, although I've, I've talked myself into playing Missouri week one. Vanderbilt and Arkansas, yes, it would be nice to open the season with them. But save those games for down the road. There's one bye week during this 10-game conference-only schedule. Use the Vandy and Arkansas game, the two perceived worst teams in the SEC heading into the season. Use those games as a bye week. That doesn't mean not take it seriously, but it's just different. We know it's different playing Vanderbilt and this Arkansas team compared to Florida, Georgia, Alabama, even Texas A&M, even Auburn. South Carolina will be a physical team, especially South Carolina's defense under Will Muschamp. Use those Arkansas and Vanderbilt games to your advantage. So theoretically, yeah, it would be nice to open the season with Vandy or Arkansas. A nice win to start the year, get the mojo going in the right direction. But save those games for down the road, hopefully, if the SEC uh, puts that together. And plus, Missouri's not going to be a good team. You get them week one, catch Georgia week two early before their their offense gels, and you have the chance for real success right out the gate. That That's a legitimate chance to go 2-0. and So just my thoughts on the 2020 schedule that, again, will be released Monday afternoon and Monday evening, 3 p.m. Eastern on the Paul Feinbaum Show. We will find out who Tennessee's week one opponent is. And then four hours later, 7 p.m. Eastern, right after Feinbaum goes off the air, we'll find out the complete, detailed Tennessee schedule. We know the opponents. We do not know the dates. And I imagine we won't find out kickoff times for the complete schedule until later down the road. But I'm sure we'll find out the kickoff times for the first month of the season that is set to begin on September 26th. In terms of who the 2020 opponents are, as I mentioned, we know who they are going to be. It's just a matter of when does Tennessee play them. The two additional opponents, Texas A&M and Auburn, 
wasn't the the best draw for Tennessee by any means, especially when you consider the frustration of the SEC not releasing how they came up with those two two teams or for any team. They they did not release publicly or even say privately the formula for adding those two additional opponents. Now, there's no doubt that they catered to the top teams in the league, but that's a different conversation for a different day. In terms of adding Texas A&M and Auburn, you get a mixed bag. There's pros and cons. The pros, you avoid LSU. I think LSU will be the second best team in the SEC West behind Alabama this season. And out of the five opponents that Tennessee could have drawn as its two additional opponents for 2020, LSU, the two Mississippi schools, Auburn, and Texas A&M. Out of those five, in my opinion, LSU was without a doubt the best team. I I think there is a gap between LSU and A&M and Auburn. I do. Uh, Even with LSU losing a bunch from the national championship team, and I'm not saying they're going to go out and win another national championship or, or compete in the SEC championship, but they still have a ton of talent on both sides of the football. They have the best receiver in football. They have the best re- or the best corner in football. Uh, they have a ton of depth on the defensive side of the ball. Plenty of weapons on the offensive side of the ball. If they can figure out their quarterback and figure out their offensive line play, they're going to be just fine. So to me, that was a win to avoid LSU. Now it is a loss for Tennessee. It is a negative that you didn't draw either Mississippi school. The two Mississippi schools were the easiest available opponents for Tennessee. And instead, they got stuck with Texas A&M and Auburn. And on the cuff, that is most definitely a a tough game. And I'm not sitting here saying Tennessee is going to win those games. I'm not saying Tennessee is going to lose those games. But Tennessee definitely has a chance to win those games, more so than people would think when you look at the team name. You hear Texas A&M and Jimbo Fisher – you, you automatically, you know, not get depressed, but you you, you expect a, a tough game. And Tennessee should expect that. But Texas A&M has some, some serious question marks heading into the season. That will be a home game for Tennessee against the Aggies. And, again, it may not matter because fans won't be in the stands. But Kellen Mond, he has not been good on the road during the course of his Texas A&M career. Uh, His passer rating is nearly 40 points worse on the road. 16 of his 24 career interceptions have been on the road. And on third down last season, he completed 47% of his third down passes, which ranked 17th overall in the SEC. (laughs) There are 14 starting quarterbacks. He ranked 17th in the SEC in passing on third down. So Kellen Mond is a very good quarterback. But he does have some deficiencies And he's going to be relying on an offensive line that has often been criticized but returns three senior starters in Dan Moore, Carson Green, and Jared Hocker. Uh, And and that offensive line has been together for quite some time now and could have as many as four senior starters up front. Uh, They helped Travion Williams in 2018 have a big season. And last year, they helped Isaiah Spiller, who was a true freshman, rush for almost 1,000 yards. So Texas A&M is strong up front in terms of running the football. But protecting Kellen Mond, that's a different scenario. That's a different story. Kellen Mond has been sacked 69 times over the last two seasons, which ranks 13th among all SEC teams during that time frame, a.k.a. second worst in terms of protecting Kellen Mond over the last two seasons. According to SECStatCat.com, Kellen Mond has been under pressure more than any other quarterback during that time with 258 total throws coming under duress. A&M has thrown the ball 963 times, Kellen Mond has been sacked on 7.17% of those throws, and he's been under pressure for a whopping 26.79% of those throws. 
sacks have to decrease for Texas A&M if Jimbo Fisher is going to take a step in year three. Now, that should give you confidence as a Tennessee fan because what is Tennessee going to be strong at in 2020? Defensive football. Defensive football. Jeremy Pruitt is a defensive-minded head coach. Derek Ansley, one of the best defensive coordinators in college football. Tennessee has one of the best secondaries in the SEC in the country. A&M has talent at receiver. Tennessee has more talent in the secondary and will make life hard for Texas A&M receivers, which will in turn make it hard for A&M to pass the ball while Kellen Mond is under pressure. Nobody open, and the defense is getting pressure on the quarterback, and it's a road game for A&M, there's a chance there. And again, A&M is going to be a good football team, but there there was a large freakout on social media when, when Tennessee fans saw Texas A&M to where it felt like those fans felt like Tennessee did not have a chance. Yes, Tennessee got screwed by the two additional opponents, but Tennessee has the has the potential to be better than Texas A&M and Auburn. They have the potential to win those football games. Again, not saying it'll happen, but there's a strong possibility. There's a good chance because I just went through the deficiencies with Texas A&M. Let's look at Auburn. I'm not buying Auburn. I think they'll be an eight-win football team, but is that going to move the needle for Gus Malzahn entering his eighth season at Auburn? No. I like Bo Nix. I think he's a heck of a talent, SEC freshman of the year last year. But he has a freshman running back that he will be relying on. He has an offensive line that is replacing a ton up front. They lost four starters off of last season's starting offensive line. They'll have new starters at both of the offensive tackle positions. And redshirt junior center Nick Brahms is the only returning offensive lineman for Auburn. They added two graduate transfers, or not graduate transfers, two junior college guys uh, that they are hoping will be able to step in and and play right away. Uh, They have Austin Troxel and Brodarius Ham, but Troxel's coming off of a a torn ACL, the second of his football career. Brodarius Ham just hasn't taken that next step to be a legitimate starting offensive lineman in the SEC. And they added an Akron graduate transfer but that doesn't move the needle a ton so yeah Bo Nix is talented Seth Williams is talented at receiver Anthony Schwartz is maybe the fastest receiver in all of college football but will Auburn be able to run the football with a freshman running back behind a inexperienced unproven offensive line I don't know will that offensive line that is inexperienced and unproven be able to take care of Bo Nix to give Bo Nix enough time to get the ball to those talented receivers I don't know we'll see there's a chance there for again defensive minded head coach Jeremy Pruitt who has had quite a bit of success against Auburn and Gus Malzahn in his coaching career at this level there there's a lot of potential for Tennessee to have success there and then you also look at the defensive side of the ball former Tennessee Vol himself Kevin Steele He's going to have a good defense, but they lose a ton on the defensive side of the ball, especially up front. The big uglies got to replace the best defensive lineman in college football last year, Derek Brown, seventh overall pick to the Panthers. You lose Marlon Davidson, NFL player, all-SEC player, four-year starter. You lose Nick Coe, who's in the NFL now. So... They have a lot to replace up front on defense. And, you know, at linebacker, <laughs> they're going to be strong at linebacker with K.J. Britt, Owen Popo. You look in the secondary, and they lose its entire secondary. They lose four of its five starters. All of them are gone to the NFL. So they'll have four new starters in the secondary out of the five DB positions when you look at both corner spots, both safety spots, and the nickel spot. So... There is, there is plenty of room for success against Auburn, even more so than Texas A&M. So, again, a, or, uh, Tennessee did get screwed by the 2020 schedule reveal, or, or at least the two additional opponents, but Tennessee is going to have a chance to win those football games 
especially going into year three under Jeremy Pruitt. That will do it for this edition of the Rocky Top Insider Podcast. I am Ben McKee. Always appreciate you tuning in and listening. Uh, This is the first of many podcasts. I appreciate you sticking with us through this podcast. And again, we will be back tomorrow. I'll be back with Brad Matthews, and we will be breaking down Tennessee's 2020 schedule. Tennessee also hits the practice field Monday evening. It is going to be a busy afternoon and evening for us media members. Week one opponent revealed at 3 o'clock. Football practice at 4. Now, we don't get to go, but Jeremy Pruitt is speaking with the media following practice uh, around 6.20 Eastern. And then 40 minutes later, the 2020 schedule will be revealed. So Brad Matthews and, uh, and myself, Ben McKee, will be back with you tomorrow to discuss the 2020 schedule in its entirety. We'll be discussing everything Jeremy Pruitt has to say this evening following Tennessee's first practice since March 12th. And we will also be breaking down practice, finding out who looks good, who doesn't look good, plenty to talk about tomorrow and we will catch you then always appreciate the support appreciate you listening have a great monday